Volcanoes. These destructive powerhouses that have shaped vast areas of Earth's magnificent landscape are not usually associated with the desert state of Arizona, but in reality, the heart of this state is home to a volcanic field similar to the likes of Hawaii in its origin. I am talking about the San Francisco Volcanic Field, much like the city of San Francisco except replace the tents with ponderosa pine and the overpriced apartment buildings with cinder cones. The story of the unusual volcanic field's creation starts around 70 million years ago with the subduction of the buoyant Farallon Plate under the North American Plate, much like that creepy uncle that hugs you for a little too long before Thanksgiving dinner the Farallon Plate hugged close to the North American Plate for several hundreds of miles in a process known as flat slab subduction before deciding to peace out into the blissful hellscape known as the mantle. As these plates grinded against each other, much like a weightlifter's thighs while they are attempting to jog, some disturbances happened on the crest above. Faulting and fracturing caused sections of the earth to rise and sink. One of these sections was the Colorado Plateau. But like my old college dorm mate, this plateau could still get higher. You see, all the uncomfortable grinding that we talked about earlier caused the section of Earth which contains the geologic plates, called the lithosphere, to thicken. This thickening caused parts of the lower lithosphere to break off and sink into the mantle in a process known as lithospheric delamination. The open space was filled with buoyant magma, which pressed up on the remaining lithosphere, raising it even higher, and thus the Colorado Plateau was risen up several thousands of feet in a relatively short span of time. Now all of these geologic structures descending into literal hell made the mantle a wee bit upset and as a result, a massive upwelling of magma emerged from the mantle and set up shop right under the lithospheric section containing North America. This magma upwelling is known as a hotspot, and no, it has nothing to do with Wi-Fi. These hotspots cause hot magma to rise up and explode out onto the surface as lava, building many volcanic structures. They also stay stationary, so as the North American plate booze cruises to the west, volcanoes pop up in an eastwardly direction because the hotspot is not moving with the overriding plate. Volcanoes started popping up just east of the modern day town of Williams, Arizona, and depending on the speed of the North American plate and the mineral composition of the lava, different volcanic structures were built, like cinder cones, which are the most prevalent, lava domes, and the crown jewel of the region, a huge stratovolcano. This stratovolcano today is called the San Francisco Peaks. It began forming 900,000 years ago, and due to plate activity being very slow at the time, it was able to accrue a lot of magma underneath it, which fueled its construction for over 500,000 years. The mountain reached a height of 14,800 feet on the upper cone and 14,600 feet on the lower cone, but once the magma fueling its rise was depleted and the plate beneath it moved away from the hot spot, it became unstable like me after one and a half hours of sitting in Phoenix traffic, and eventually collapsed like a blue collar worker when they see how much taxes are removed from their paychecks. Although I am showing Mount St. Helens, this was not an eruption, but actually a massive landslide. Today, the mountain is 12,633 feet tall, and it's Arizona's highest point. Following this, volcanism kept trending east, and as recently as 1,000 years ago, the volcanic eruptions that formed the Sunset Crater Cinder Cone took place, which indicates the field is still active. Now let's discuss some native history. Around 1,000 years ago, the Anastasi, who lived near the Little Colorado River, and the Sinagua, who lived near Walnut Canyon, saw literal fire erupting from the earth and thought to themselves, hmm, we should live here. 
So they established Pueblo-style houses and used the fertile ash from the eruptions to do some good old farming by their available water sources nearby. Eventually that sweet ash stopped falling and crops started dying. So the Anastasia and the Sanagua packed their bags and left the area. Following this, tribes like the Navajo, the Hopi, who were an offshoot branch of the New Mexican Pueblo peoples, and the Apache started taking root in the region. For the Navajo, the San Francisco Peaks was a sacred mountain which delineated the tribe's original western boundary. They called the peaks Dokoslid, which means mountain that never melts. The Apache were not as prevalent in the region, but I mention them because of their several conflicts with the Navajo. A notable instance is the Apache Death Cave conflict. It started after the Apache raided a Navajo settlement near the Little Colorado River, killing nearly everyone there. Enraged, the Navajo tracked down the raiding party, cornered them in a cave near Two Guns, Arizona, and proceeded to block them in with fire and eventually killed all 42 of the Apache with smoke inhalation. Today, all three of the tribes I mentioned are still prevalent in the region with their respective reservations. Early European history was largely dead in the region. The San Francisco peaks were viewed by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado on his expedition in 1541, and he named them but never really got close to them. Basically, dang, look at those cool mountains. All right, let's move on. The first settlement in the region was established by a man named Antoine Leroux, an American explorer who established a settlement about eight miles north of modern-day Flagstaff. As years passed, the area was used as a route to get to California. By 1880, a rail line was constructed and a massive lumber industry was created in the town. The University NAU was established in 1899 and the famous Route 66 was through Flagstaff by 1926. Notably, on top of Mars Hill in the Lowell Observatory, Clyde Tombaugh discovered the former planet of Pluto in 1930. Today, Flagstaff is mainly known for the nearby ski area called Snowbowl and the still operational and active University of NAU, which I personally attended for about three years. Now for some hikes in the region. Now I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so I'll try to be brief. I highly recommend a visit to Wapatki, Sunset Crater, and Walnut Canyon National Monuments. I also really recommend that you do the hike up to the top of Eldon Peak. It's a strenuous one, but if you do it during the fall, you get this little baby aspen forest to yourself. It's really beautiful. A little stroll in Buffalo Park right after monsoon season will show you a lot of sunflowers and really good views of the San Francisco peaks. A hike just north of Flagstaff called Red Mountain shows you an eroded cinder cone that looks like a red rock wonderland. It is super awesome. I highly recommend you check it out. And probably the coolest and most notable hike in Flagstaff is hiking to the top of Humphreys Peak. This is not for the faint of heart. It's about 3,000 feet elevation gain, taking you above 12,000 feet, and it's about 10 miles but absolutely stunning views. You can see all the way into Utah from the top. It is super, super beautiful. One of my favorite hikes I've ever done in my life. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you'd like more videos like it, please leave a like and a comment down below, and I'd appreciate it if you subscribed. And a quick reminder to get out and hike. Again, thank you very much for watching. New videos coming out weekly.